To really understand air pressure, you have to imagine that a column of air follows you everywhere on Earth and extends all the way to outer space. You're very much like fish in that fish aren't too aware that they live in an ocean made of water. You don't realize that you live in an ocean, but it's made of air. This air has a pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level. The air around you is denser at sea level, whereas if you climb in altitude, the air gets thinner. Here is one square inch, and I have a quarter taped in for scale. So every square inch, the air at sea level weighs 14.7 pounds. Other units of air pressure include atmospheres, so at sea level, one atmosphere, or you could say 760 millimeters of mercury, or 760 torr, or 101.325 kilopascals. At sea level, the mercury inside a barometer, which is a tool used to measure air pressure, will rise to 760 millimeters, or 76 centimeters, which is roughly two and a half feet. You can predict the weather by observing changes to the air pressure. In high pressure zones where the air is dry and there's more nitrogen and oxygen, which makes it heavier, you can expect clear skies. In low pressure zones where the air is lighter now that it has moisture content and water, you can expect to see rain on the forefront. As you can see on the weather map, Along the high pressure zones, you see clear sunny skies, and along the low pressure fronts, you have cloudy rainy weather. The air gets thinner at high altitudes, and there are over 200 corpses littered on the side of Mount Everest from climbers who died of exhaustion or hypoxia, which is the lack of getting oxygen at high altitudes. Airplane cabins are pressurized at cruising altitudes of 12,000 meters. In the event of an emergency in which the airplane cabin is depressurized, Oxygen masks are deployed for the passengers. Athletes who train at high altitudes are thought to be in better condition because they produce more red blood cells, which delivers more oxygen to the body. There's a theory that the success of the Denver Broncos can be attributed to them living in the Mile High City of Denver, where their opponents who are traveling on the road tend to struggle because they have less fitness playing at high altitudes. There's quite a lot you could do with a bell jar when you want to illustrate the effects of air pressure so here I am, I'm handling this metal base and I'm attaching a hose to it, which is connected to a vacuum pump. And then that's the glass bell jar itself. So I'm just showing that before I vacuum out the air, the bell jar is able to be lifted. But now the air is leaving and we're just gonna give it a few moments here. What's actually gonna happen is the outside air is gonna clamp on the bell jar. So as soon as I seal the bell jar and I remove the hose, the outside air pressure takes over. And remember, the air pressure is heavy. It's 14.7 pounds per square inch, and now it's created a tight seal. So you can think of air as a pushing force. It's a downwards pushing force, and it causes these two structures to get clamped together. So now I'm showing the class, all right, we're going to open up this thing again so that it allows the air to come back inside. And the air then pushes apart the bell jar and the metal base. So this demonstration was just to show you that the air is around you and it has a lot of weight. In this next demonstration, we are going to boil water by removing the air pressure around it. So again, you can think of air as being a downwards pushing force. And if I remove it, then the water has a much easier time jumping out of the beaker and boiling. So currently you're looking at water, which is at room temperature or 23 degrees Celsius. So after a few moments, all the air has been vacuumed out of the bell jar and the water begins to boil at room temperature. So the water is not hot, it's not scalding hot, but it just boils because again, the air that was holding it down is no longer there. So then the water just jumps out on its own and that's what we call boiling. Boiling doesn't mean the liquid has to be hot. It just means the liquid has to overcome the downwards pushing force of air. So inside a bell jar where there's no air, the water can just jump out on its own quite easily. So here I am just to prove to you that there's no sorcery going on and that the bell jar is not hot or that the metal base it's standing on is some sort of heating plate. I'm just going to take this thing apart and we're just going to feel around. Okay, so I'm touching the beaker. It's not hot at all. I'm touching the plate. It's not hot and I'm feeling the water. And the water is cool, it's just 23 degrees Celsius. A moment ago it was boiling because we took out the air inside the bell jar and the water was able to leap out on its own. I'll just give you more examples so that you can think of air pressure as a pushing force 
So if I vacuum out the air within the bell jar, the balloon starts to expand because nothing is holding it down. There's no air to collapse on it. There's no weight pressing down on the balloon, so the balloon is free to expand. And at some point, it's going to burst and explode because it gets too big. Okay, so here we are with a blue balloon this time, and I've vacuumed out the air, so I turned on the machine, and now the air is leaving the bell jar. It's exiting the bell jar, and then the balloon expands. And then in just a moment, we're going to go ahead and stop the machine, and we're going to allow the air to rush back inside the bell jar. So here I am. I'm going to turn off the machine, take the hose out, and then the air will then rush back into the bell jar, and it's going to press on the balloon again. So that's why it shrinks. We're now going to do the balloon orb demonstration. And what I'm showing you here is I have a balloon tucked inside of this glass orb, and I'm blowing on it. But as soon as I let go, then the balloon collapses because there's a hole at the bottom and the air is able to move freely. But if I cork it, then the balloon stays expanded, even though there's a hole at the top there. So now we're going to set this thing inside a bell jar and we're going to see the effects of air pressure. Alright, this is playing at 1.5 times speed. So the air that's trapped inside the orb below the balloon starts to push upwards once the air inside the bell jar is vacuumed out. So I turned on the machine, the air is being vacuumed out, it's leaving, and that means the air that was trapped inside the orb can now overcome the weight that used to hold it down. So it pushes the balloon outwards. But we can also reverse this effect too. So if I turn off the machine, which I'm going to do in just a moment here. So we're going to turn off the vacuum pump, remove the hose, let the air come back inside. It's going to push the balloon back into the orb. So I turn on the vacuum pump, and now it's removing the air from inside the bell jar. And when this happens, the pockets of air that were trapped inside the foam is able to expand outwards. So now we have a shaving cream foam monster growing inside of this bell jar because there's no air pressing down on it. So naturally it's able to grow. But once I turn off the vacuum pump and I let the air back inside, the heavy outside air pressure rushes in and the foam collapses. I'm going to show you how a siphon works. So here I am off to the side. I'm going to fill a hose with a little bit of water and I'm going to dip this end into the top. And then as soon as I remove my thumb from the bottom of the hose, the water just starts to flow downhill. Okay, so a siphon uses the weight of air to do work. Remember, air has a pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's quite a bit. So it's able to just push the water downhill through the hose. And a siphon will always work this way. You can always move water from a higher location to a lower location. And you can use the weight of air to do work for you. However, you can't go uphill. That's impossible. You can't push the water uphill through the hose. But this is very useful for things like cleaning fish tanks or if you're into boating, you might have to siphon some water that gets into your boat. Hey, thanks for tuning in to part one where you saw how air pressure is a downwards pushing force and it's got a lot of crazy effects around you. In part two, I'm going to discuss phase diagrams and vapor pressure. So I'll see you guys there. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time on Wind Chemistry.